main campus um, where I work on studying materials and how you can make new materials using chemistry. And I'm Ben, and uh, I'm from Mexico. I'm a PhD student in the chemistry department, and I'm working on quantum chemistry, which is how to use computers to simulate uh, chemical experiments. OK, so um, I'll be kicking us off tonight looking at seeing and hearing the chemistry of art. But before I get into chemistry in particular, I want to talk briefly about science and art in general, because they're generally thought of as very disparate things. Science is thought of as very technical and quantitative, whereas on the other hand, art is thought of as very creative and imaginative. But it turns out there's a lot of overlap. For example, if we go back to this medicine cabinet, this isn't just any medicine cabinet. If you take a step back, it's actually a piece of a gallery installation that was done by Damien Hurst. And he did this with the express purpose of relating, um, of relating that better? Um, so he did this with the express purpose of relating a laboratory and hospital to a art gallery space. And to me, this is a very important connection because science actually involves a lot of creativity, which is something that most people don't realize. On the other hand, um, if we look at this piece of art, it actually turns out that this particular work was made by a professor in the chemistry and physics departments at Harvard. Um, and it was made by simulating what happens to 100,000 electrons as they go through a um, specific um, surface. And it, there's a lot of different examples of like this where you can use scientific images that are very beautiful. And for example, um, Vinny and Steph mentioned there's a gallery of science in the news. Um, there's also a lot of other examples that are listed on the handout we're giving out. Um, and and the point of that is just to relate that um, even though we think of science and art as very different, there are actually a lot of overlap. And today we'll be talking about two different facets of this overlap. First, I will be talking about how we can take advantage of some of the technical and quantitative information that science can provide and learn more about works of art from that. And then in the second part, Ben will um, think about making art from science, but instead of looking at visual art, he'll actually look at making music and being able to listen to some of the science. If we look at using analytical chemistry to learn more about art, most of the work that's done in this is done in the context of art restoration. So you have a image, um, this is a fresco from a uh, church in Spain, and it was partially, um, you can see here that it's starting to, it was starting to flake off. This example in particular, um, someone took it upon themselves to fix and ended up completely changing the image that came off. So you, you may have heard about this in the news. Um, it was very popular uh, when it happened in 2012. This ended up being somewhat successful because it became a tourist destination because people were so interested in having uh, seen this seen that this happened on the news, people ended up going to this church. Um, so it worked out for them. But ideally, um, this wouldn't happen to works of art. You would leave it in the original state, but just fixed. An example of art restoration that works slightly better than that um, is this statue from the Met in New York that was a marble statue um, that's very famous because of the time period it's from. And it, and it actually um, fell in the middle of the night and broke. And they came in the next day and found this statue that was in tons of pieces all over the floor. And conservators came in, found all the pieces, carefully figured out where they go together, and reassembled the statue. They also used a um, replica of the statue to see how it, exactly it should look. Remade the statue. It took over 10 years, but it's, uh, they put it back up on display in 2014. And um, they part of the restoration was that they figured out what material it was made out of and why it fell and were able to reinforce it so that it won't fall again. And that is really getting at the key point of this part of the talk, which is that what a piece of art is made out of is really important. The material itself matters a lot because um, it can tell us a lot of different things. For example, 
what an artwork is made out of can tell us how we can alter it without hurting it, whether that's to prevent future degradation from occurring. For example, if that fresco had been coated with something that prevented the degradation, then we might have not needed the restoration in the first place. And if something does happen and we do need to restore a piece of art, if we know what it's made out of, we can do that more effectively. Additionally, um, looking beyond art restoration, you can actually learn a lot about a piece of art by knowing what it's made out of, whether that's how it was made or when it was made. It can give us a lot of information about the artist and the techniques that the artists use. And it can also be used to identify art forgeries. So mat the material is really important. When I go to an art, art museum, granted I'm a materials chemist, but that's actually what I look at. So I first will look at the painting. This is a painting I saw this summer at the Getty in LA. And um, after I look at the painting, I will go over to the um, area next to the painting that says both the name of the, the name of the work, who made it, when it was made, and more importantly, to me at least, is what it's made out of. And that's actually the key question in this field known as conservation science. What is this artwork made out of? There's, turns out there's not a lot of historical evidence for knowing um, what things are made out of in art. There's basically only this one book, the Craftsman's Handbook, which was written by Cennino Cennini in the 15th century in Italy. And that's basically all we have from that time period on, on the techniques that artists used. So what we have to turn to instead is, is using analytical chemistry to try and tease apart, gain information about what the material is, to be able to learn more about, um, about the work itself. So before I go any farther, I want to give a little bit uh, background on the anatomy of a painting because I'll mostly be focusing on paintings, although a lot of these techniques can be used in other types of work, statues, works on paper. Um, I'm going to focus on paintings, so I want to give a little bit of um, background so we're all on the same page. So if you have a painting, the, the first thing you start with is some sort of support, whether that's a canvas or paper or something else. On the support, there's generally a ground layer, so if you've ever painted a room, you might be familiar with using primer. With a painting, there's usually a ground layer, and with that, there can be an underpainting or underdrawing where the artist will start to sketch out what the composition that they want will look like. Over this, they actually put the layers of paint. Um, this is obviously not necessarily one layer, but it's, it's, most of it is similar material. And paint is actually has two main components that, conser that conservation scientists look at. One is the pigment, so that's what color it has and is. Um, you may be familiar um, with different types of pigments. I gave two examples of ultramarine and vermilion. There's a lot of other pigments that you may be familiar with. Um, but in addition to the pigment, a key part of the paint is the binding medium or binder. And that's what keeps the pigment suspended and attached to the substrate. Some examples, you may be familiar with oil paint that uses oil as the binder. Or you may be familiar with acrylic paint that uses an acrylic polymer as the binding medium. And then on top of the paint layer, sometimes artists will use a layer of varnish that gives um, a nice sheen to the painting and also can be used to protect the paint layers underneath. Um, with analytical chemistry, different techniques that we use can give us insight into different aspects and different different and the different layers, different aspects of one layer or different information about the different layers. So we use um, this as an example. This is a splatter painting that was attributed to Jackson Pollock. And by analyzing the binder of the paint, they actually found that the um, binder contained a material that wasn't developed until after Jackson Pollock's death, um, which they used as one piece of evidence that um, this painting is, was actually a forgery and was not done by Jackson Pollock. So in the next part of my talk, I'll go a little bit more into the details of the, of the techniques that conservation scientists use. But before I do, I wanted to see if any of you have any more questions. Yes? What's the difference, what's the difference between analytical chemistry and quantum, what was it? Um, yeah, so that question is, what's the difference between analytical chemistry and quantum chemistry? Yes. Analy analytical chemistry is just a lot of a set of tools that chemists use to learn about what something's made out of, which I'll talk about for basically for the rest of my part of the talk. Quantum chemistry is um, the is what Ben will be talking about. 
And it's basically um, trying to understand what happens when you get to really small scales that atoms, that atoms are. Um, there's a slightly different physics that occurs than what happens on the scale of uni. Yeah. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of background, I'm going to go into the actual chemical tools that we use, the analytical chemistry tools. And conservation scientists generally break up the tools they use into two categories. One is non-destructive techniques. Um, this is for like if you go to the hospital and get an x-ray done or an MRI, um, where um, if, if we look at art, we can also do x-ray imaging. And we also use a technique called spectroscopy, which is actually several types of techniques that I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, where you can quantify light absorption. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The other type of techniques are destructive techniques, where just like if you go to the hospital and they take your blood or you do a biopsy, they actually take a piece to look at to learn something about. Um, your medical condition and similarly if we're looking at art we sometimes have to take a piece because that's the only way we can get the information we, need, we want. Um, one of the destructive techniques is actually taking a cross section where if with a painting they'll actually go in and take a slice of the painting and get at all the different layers I talked about and then either use non-destructive or destructive techniques to analyze them. There's also um, techniques called chromatography and mass spectrometry. They're generally used together and they're good at quantifying um, how big the molecules that are present are. And what I'll spend most of my time in destructive techniques talking about is peptide mass fingerprinting, which is a tool that we can use to identify proteins. So first I'll start with non-destructive techniques. If we look at x-ray imaging, um, this is an x-ray of someone's chest cavity. And when I look at this, I see two main things. One is that the lungs are black. The other is that the bones are white. So the question is why? Lungs are, look black because inside your lungs are air, and air is not very dense. So the x-rays can actually pass through. So it looks black. That indicates that density is important for what we see in an x-ray image. The other thing that's important is composition. So if we look at these bones, um, what's the difference between bones? You can think about what's the differences between bones and soft tissue. And one of the differences is that bones contain calcium and soft tissue is made, mo ma is made mostly of carbon and oxygen. And um, this is a periodic table and one of the things it can tell us is that the carbon and oxygen that the soft tissue is made out of is on the second row, the calcium is on the fourth row. That means that calcium is heavier than ca carbon and oxygen and that's why we can see it more intensely in the x-ray image. So the composition of the material um, is very important in whether or not we see it in the x-ray image. If we move to looking at works of art, this is a painting that was done by Van Gogh, and it's at the Harvard Art Museum in Cambridge. And they, they did an x-ray image of this, and what they found was that the x-ray image is something totally different. And what they think happened is that Van Gogh painted something, what looks like a vase of flowers, uh, and then for whatever reason painted over it a different painting, which is what we see now. Um, from the x-ray image, um, I think it's really cool is that you can actually see um, these small lines along the edge and what that is is because x-rays are really good at seeing heavy elements that's actually the metal that's in the nail that was used to nail the canvas to the wood frame of the canvas. Okay so we just talked about x-ray imaging the next technique I want to talk about is spectroscopy and Basically, all spectroscopy is, is a way of quantifying light and quantifying the energy of the light that gets absorbed. So if we look, spectroscopy basically at its essence is you have some sort of light that comes in to an unknown sample. The, the sample absorbs some of the light, reflects some of the light, and some of the light passes through. If the sample is thin enough, the energy of the light that gets reflected and the energy of the light that passes through is the same and the absorbed light um, is, is different. With spectroscopy we can quantify the light that gets reflected 
or transmitted and therefore get the light that gets absorbed um, based on the energy of the light. Um, that's a little bit abstract, so I'm going to um, give it a little more detail. So there's a lot of different types of spectroscopy that fit that um, role that I just explained. And um, it, depends on the, it all depends on the energy of the light. So this is all the different energies of light that are possible. Um, you may be familiar with some of them. This is the high energy end. There's gamma rays, there's x-rays, which we just talked about. Um, visible light, which you may be familiar with since that's how we see. Um, there's microwave light, which is how we heat up food in our kitchens sometimes. Uh, there's radio waves, which are how we listen to the radio when we're driving in our car. Um, and then long radio waves. This is the low energy of the spectrum. This is the high energy of the end of the spectrum. There's different types of spectroscopy that use the different pieces of the spectrum. And because they all have different energy, we can get different information out of it. We just talked about x-rays. We know that x-rays are good at seeing heavy elements. And it turns out that you can be more quantitative than just an x-ray image and do spectroscopy and learn more about the composition. So I actually use a type of spectroscopy called x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, um, where I can identify the elemental composition of the material I make using this technique. There's also um, visible spectroscopy, where you can look at a um, color and quantify what color it is based on the different um, energies, which is the different colors of light. And then finally, there's infrared spectroscopy, which is used a lot in chemistry, and that's what I'll talk a little bit more about. But what infrared spectroscopy allows you to do is look at the molecular bonds. Okay, so what exactly do I mean by that? Um, we'll talk about that. So with, infra if, with infrared spectroscopy, we're looking at molecular bondings. Um, we start, w whenever we have a molecule, we start with an atom. So here I have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. If they share electrons, they form a bond. This entire thing is called a molecule. And it turns out that molecules actually um, aren't just static, they vibrate and they're moving. And so with mo water, it's very simple. There's only three atoms in the mo entire molecule. And so there's only three types of vibrations that we get. And since infrared spectroscopy, the energy of infrared light is the same as the energy of the vibrations, then we can identify the vibrations using infrared spectroscopy. So this is an infrared spectrum of water. And you can see there's three different peaks, one here, one here, and one here. And they correlate to the three different vibrations of water. There's a lot of chemists that spend a lot of time trying to predict and calculate where exactly the peaks are and how big they are, so how intense the absorption is. And Ben will get a little bit more into that later. Um, but it actually turns out to be very complicated. Um, for the purpose of my part of the talk, I'm showing you an IR spectrum of water. Most molecules are bigger than water, and their infrared spectrum is a little bit more complicated. Um, so we use references where we have the material we think it is and compare and use that to compare instead of trying to predict what um, vibrations we expect to see. So if we go back to this painting that was attributed to Jackson Pollock, the way that they looked at the binding medium was actually using this infrared spectroscopy. So the red square is where they, they took the spectrum and they were looking at the black paint. And this is the spectrum of the painting that they got. And so what they did was compare it to three references. One is gum arabic, which is a natural um, binding medium. The next is the acryloid TMB67, which is a man-made acrylic binding medium that was developed after Jackson Pollock's death. And then the final one is uh, a pigment called pigment black one um, that also that Jackson Pollock used. So when they looked at the spectrum, it looks like it's an overlap, um, gum arabic and pigment black. But this peak in particular only, look, only matches this peak from the acryloid. And so they use that to, as an indication that the acryloid is actually present in the, um, in the material, and therefore that this painting must have been made after 1965.
Okay, so my final example of a non-destructive technique is actually not a non-destructive um, conservation technique, is not a non-destructive technique to learn about the art, but actually a non-destructive technique to restore art. So when we restore art, like we saw initially, you're actually doing something to your painting or statue. Um, and ideally, this wouldn't be the case. Whatever you would do, you could undo so you can restore it so that when people look at it, it looks the way it was intended. Um, but it would also be able to undo it so that if someone wants to look at how it actually looks now, they still can. Um, it turns out recently um, some researchers at Harvard did this using light projections where they took this mural that was totally degraded and changed color and used light projections to correct it to the color that it originally was. These murals, there's a set of them they're really big paintings made by Mark Rothko, and he gave them to Harvard, and they ha Harvard had them on display, but because of the combination of pigments that were used, they, um, the pigments became extra sensitive to light, and so they were in a very sunny room and just became degraded and totally changed color. They didn't realize this until one day they unwrapped one of the murals that wasn't on display and saw that it was a completely different color. And so what they did was they used that mural, they used pictures of the murals from, the, from when they were first made, and they um, looked at the pigments that were used and what color they should make, and they actually figured out what color the, the mural should look like, looked at what color they were, and calculated the light that you would need to project on it so that it looks the correct color and made projections to do that. And so it ends up looking like this. Um, and until July, these were on display at the Harvard Art Museums where you could go and see the murals in person with the light projectors. And then every day, an hour before closing, they would turn off the projectors so, you could, so if you stayed, you could actually see what it looks like without the projector. Um, and what's nice about this method is that you get the correct color, you get the correct feeling from the work, but you don't lose any of the things like artist brush strokes or anything else. So it retains a lot of the character that the artist intended, but it also looks the way the artist intended, even though it doesn't anymore. So with that, I'm um, finished talking about non-destructive techniques, and next we'll talk about destructive techniques. But before I do, I wanted to see if anyone has any questions. Yes? Doesn't that sort of change the reality of the art? I mean, you're using science to change what it looks like. Do you worry about science sort of interacting with art in that way, or is that like an interesting development? Yeah, so the question was if science, if, if we're worried at all about changing the reality of the art, right? Um, so I think that's maybe open to interpretation a little bit. Um, in my opinion, I would say that um, I think you're changing the reality of the art because it degraded. And so the question is then, um, do you want it to look more like the artist intended? Or would you like it to look more like it does now? And there's definitely people who don't think any conservation should be done. Um, but I think what's nice about this is that you actually can sort of have it both ways. Yeah. Yes. I was just thinking about the, uh, the binder that was fully developed after Jackson. All of, you know, I'm wondering if it's possible that even though it was formally developed at that time, did he maybe get a hold of something that somebody was tinkering with? Yeah, so the question was about the binder that was identified after Jackson Pollock's death, and that's actually one of, um, so, and whether or not maybe he used it before it was um, brought to market. And there are a lot of examples of artists using, particularly people as prominent as Jackson Pollock, using people sending them things that are in development, um, for sure. And so we can't know that for sure. That's why you can't say this is definitely a forgery. Um, however, they did look into that a little bit and looked at the, per the where it was developed, whether or not they were um, conversing at all. and. Um, they seem to think that in this case, that's, that's not what happened, but it definitely could have. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to talking about destructive techniques. Um, so I went over them all before, but again, this is something where um, it's just like if you get your blood work or a biopsy where they take something, 
from the painting or object and anal use it to analyze it. And while we are taking something, um, the, the actual size of what we're taking is very small. So this is a penny showing the approximate size of a sample that you might you need for a destructive technique. So obviously this would be preferable if you didn't need this at all, but there's a lot of important information you can get from these destructive techniques. And so sometimes we still have to take something, but it is at least small. And the main destructive technique I'll be talking about is peptide mass fingerprinting, which is used to identify protein. And so I'm going to give a few examples of where proteins are found in artwork. Um, this is a um, one example is parchment. So this is a um, sheep parchment that is from a Koran that Harvard owns. And um, by looking at the parchment, because it was made from sheep, there's actually sheep proteins that are still present in the parchment. And so we can use, we can try to analyze where the parchment was from, identify that it's sheep based on the proteins. In addition to the substrate, um, proteins can be used in the binding medium for paints. So this is a <clears throat> altarpiece from the 14th century um, in Italy where uh, egg was used as the binding medium. So if you're familiar with egg tempera, you literally mix the, per the pigment with egg and maybe some other things and then use that um, as your paint. Egg was also used a lot as a varnish, particularly egg white. Um, and so if, if a painting used that, we can we can actually identify the proteins in the eggs. If you eat eggs, you know that they have protein. Um, and use those to identify um, that it's egg and what type of egg was used. So the way this technique works, it's called peptide mass fingerprinting, and you take a protein and then you cut it into smaller pieces that are known as peptides. We then take the peptides and use an instrument called a mass spectrometer. and um, basically get the mass or the weight of all the different little pieces of the protein. And because you're cutting them in a very specific way, you end up getting a very specific pattern depending on the protein you started with. So you get a fingerprint based on the protein, the original protein. And in this way you're able to identify the protein that you started with. Um, so just as an example, um, I actually spent some time working at the Harvard Art Museums, and um, I worked on a project looking at peptide mass fingerprinting of egg tempera paints. And one of the things we did was look at different species of egg and um, whether or not you can identify them with this method. And it turns out you can really easily. So these are three different eggs, quail eggs, chicken eggs, and duck eggs. And you can see that the mass spectrum that you get from them is very different even though they're all eggs and they have similar proteins in them, they're different enough that we can tell them apart with this technique. Um, we didn't really expect that to go anywhere, but then it turned out that the person I was working with, Dan Kirby, who's actually here tonight, um, went on and was looking at a textile from uh, the Spanish artist Fortuny, and he was looking at um, the varnish layer on this textile and identified it um, and then used peptide mass fingerprinting. And initially, um, it didn't match any of the kind of common varnishes, but then it turned out that the varnish was made with um, duck egg. And this was one of the first examples that they found that it wasn't just chicken eggs that were used in art, but actually different types of eggs as well. And since then, he's gone on to look at a lot of different um, pieces of art and um, cultural heritage, heritage objects and been able to identify not just the proteins but also the species of animal that um, the different um, components came from. So for example, this is a kayak that they looked at from Alaska and when they looked first at the um, deck material and they found that it, um, so that's shown in red, and they found that it closely matches um, proteins from bearded seals. So you can see that the peaks all line up with each other, which indicates that the deck is made out of bearded seal. They then also looked at the stitching that stitches the kayak together and identified it, were able to identify it as caribou. Again, because the, the sample, which is shown in red, matches the peaks for the reference caribou that's shown in blue. <clears throat> 
They then went on and looked at um, book bindings. So this is an example of a book that originally um, was attributed to be bound with human skin. And um, the reason that they thought that was because the inscription inside the book said, you know, the binding of this book is all that remains of my dear friend Jonas Wright. Um, and so they, they actually looked at this because, you know, human skin also contains proteins that we can identify. Um, but when they looked at it, they actually found that it's not human skin and it's made out of sheep instead. Um, and that actually brings me to the end of my portion of the talk. Um, just to summarize, I talked about um, both non-destructive and destructive techniques that can be used to learn about um, how and when a piece of art was made, as well as how to alter it without hurting it. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, there's, there's some more information on the handout, but there's also actually a, an online course that you can take. I've never taken it. I don't know anything about it, but it says that it just is about science and art, the chemistry of art materials and conservation. And so presumably they go into a little bit more detail than I did today um, about the chemistry of works of art. There's also a part of the Harvard Art Museum's website where you can um, look at paintings and objects, that, some of which are actually on display, that you can go see and learn more about the, um, what the conservation scientists learn about the different pieces of art. Um, and two of the examples I showed tonight are actually from that website. And if you go on, you can, you can also see, so that like, for example, the x-ray image, um, where it had the Van Gogh painting and then the x-ray image behind it, has a slider. So you can actually go from, this is the painting, and then you can slide across and see where the different x-ray part was connected to the part on top. And this is all on the handout that's up front. Um, and so that brings me to the end of my portion of the talk. However, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Um, I was just wondering when you um, are processing the um, different proteins, is that something that's done manually, like are you visually matching them, or is it something that um, is automated that you run? So initially we were doing it by hand just because we didn't have that many reference spectra and um, we didn't have that many samples we were looking at, but um, the idea of what we were doing was to make a, um, a like a reference library and, and that's actually what they've done. So I worked there like almost five years ago now and, and they now have a, a library that you can compare to. Yeah. Yes. What happens to a mixture of stems from different species and if you have standards for only say one of them, can you still positively identify that one that's mixed with other yeah, so the, so the question was about mixtures of proteins or mixtures of species. And the answer is yes, we can easily identify even mixtures of proteins. So even, for example, in sheep parchment or in egg tempera, there's more than one protein present, even though it's all egg. Um, and we can still identify the different proteins. And um, so if there was one that we didn't have a reference for, we might not necessarily notice that it was that there was something that we couldn't identify, but we would be able to identify all the other ones. Yeah. Yes? Is this kind of, are these kind of techniques used in uh, other uh, areas of like, you know, archaeology and you know, finding uh, artifacts from uh, ancient civilizations? And that yeah, kind of definitely. Thing? So the question was about, um, instead of just looking at art, also looking at archaeology and archaeological artifacts. And a lot of these techniques can also be applied there. Um, most of the ones I talked about were about paintings. And I think archaeological objects are more actual objects. And so they wouldn't necessarily use specifically the ones I talked about. But you, there are other ones, and even some of the ones I did talk about, you can use on um, archaeological objects. And then, of course, they're also used in science research, right, if you're trying to make a specific um, pharmaceutical drug molecule, then you might use IR spectroscopy to see if, you know, that, that was successful or not. Yeah. Yes. I'm making the assumption that restoration today, that the restorer would try to use the original material that was, at, had been analyzed by a chemist. What did they do before this technique was available? I mean, restorers from the last century 
Um, so the question is about art restoration before they used analytical chemistry. Um, I think analytical chemistry has been used, um, it's not really super recent, it's not like this is a brand new field, um, but before that, I'm actually not sure what they did, but I would guess that they just guessed what it was made out of based on his, the history and the artist and would do their best at restoring it. Um, but there are definitely examples of paintings that were, um, you know, they thought it was one thing and it was actually something else and, you know, in the process of cleaning, it actually dissolved some of, um, of the paint or something. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Or do they just like, Let's break it down. Yeah. So that's a good point. The question was about um, how prevalent using te these techniques is, and um, it's because it's somewhat time intensive, and you need someone who understands the science behind it. It's it's not um, used on like everything. Um, it's more if a curator um, wants to use a specific piece in a show, but it's not restored. Then you might need to do some analytical chemistry to see what it's made out of so that someone can restore the work. Um, it's also used a lot in instances where they're trying to identify forgeries. Um, and I think a lot of this is more prevalent in Europe versus in the US. But there are most museums have at least one or two scientists on staff to do these sorts of things and look at the art in this way. Yeah. Yes. So, I've got a as I understand it, it, it didn't help like slicing up the proteins mm -hmm. to do the weighing. Yeah. Um, which sounds a little bit like the way people use, I think it's called restriction enzymes, to slice up DNA and then they, they do something kind of similar. What, do you have a choice of different things to use to slice up the peptides? And, and where did they come from? What's their role in nature? The, the things yeah, that so um, the question was about the actual process of cutting up the proteins into the peptides. For the work that I showed here, we use an enzyme called trypsin that's found in the body and actually cuts it at very specific locations. And so that's why we used it, because it's predictable. I'm not actually an expert on that area, so I don't know what other, one, what other enzymes or um, components they would use, but I would imagine that different techniques might use different ones. But everybody's got, got to kind of standardize on trypsin, so the, the, the charts that you put in the library all match. Yeah, so if, if you um, are using the library that was made with trypsin, then you would need to use trypsin also to cut it. So people are using some other things. So um, my understanding is that whenever you use peptide mass fingerprinting, you're using trypsin. Yeah. So actually, the source of the enzyme, most of them are actually, like trypsin is something that you uh, have in your stomach that's digesting what you're eating as well. So it's natural, it's the chocolate proteins that I 